Hi, everybody. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar-Ilan University. And now we'll continue our course that's called SOC 101 for everything you wanted to know about a computer but were afraid to ask. And now we'll start lecture two, the microprocessor. So where are we in this course and what are we going to do in this lecture? We showed this kind of a very high level um, view of a system on a chip in the last lecture. And today we're going to be going into the heart of the uh, SOC, which is the embedded processor. So let's start with some introduction and a bit of history about the microprocessor. So let's start with traditional classes of computers. And of course, we all know our personal computers, like the computer that I'm recording this lecture on now. That's our desktop or our laptop. It's made for general purpose. It can run a variety of software. And of course, there's a cost performance trade-off because we want as high performance as possible. But for something that we're going to use at home and buy for our kids and so forth, we have to reduce the cost as much as possible. On the other hand, when we go over to, to web servers, uh, to server computers, maybe to the old time mainframe, these are going to be network based. They're going to provide you know, the basis for the cloud or whatever. They're going to be very high capacity. They're going to have to deliver the best performance as possible and provide as much reliability as can be. And so therefore, we're going to really be able to pay um, very high costs for them um, to get the most performance we can. They really can range from small servers to really building sized data centers. Our next kind of uh, class is a supercomputer, and we have a Cray supercomputer here. Cray is, you know, the um, the classic company that was designing supercomputers, and these are our government type or really large, large enterprise type things uh, that are built um, in specific places and used for high-end scientific and engineering calculation. They're really the highest capability, but they represent a small fraction of the overall computer market. Finally, of course, we have the embedded computers, which we discussed in depth in the last lecture. And they're really hidden components of systems. They really have stringent power performance and cost constraints. We really trade off these different factors when we're designing them. And just to remind you, an embedded computer is a computer inside another device that's used for running one predetermined application or a collection of software. However, what these all have in common are specific components. So if we go to Patterson and Hennessy, you know, they give this picture of a heart, a human heart or a, a, a mammal's heart. And we have five classic components of the computer similar to the heart. We have the input, the output. We have the memory uh, over here. Um, we have the data path and the control. And when we talk about this, all of the, the different types of computers, the desktops, the servers, and embedded computers, they will all have these basic components. When we talk about the microprocessor, what we're talking about is these two parts, the data path and the control, which are shown here um, on the left side of the heart. So just to mention um, briefly that we have input-output devices, and we'll be discussing input-output and network connections and so forth um, later on in the course. But what we have here are different things such as user interface devices, like the display that I'm looking at and you guys are looking at now, the keyboard that I typed up this stuff with, and the mouse that I'm moving around this little red dot. Um, we have storage devices that can be used, for example, for uh, different types of memory. And these can be hard disks, CDs, DVDs, flash, and they'll be outside um, you know, as peripherals to the system. And of course, network adapters that enable us to communicate with other computers. Those are all going to be part of the I.O. So now we'll dive into some of the history to kind of get an understanding of where this all came from. And the first computer is undoubtedly the analytical engine, which was um, designed and uh, envisioned by, you know, um, this guy, Charles Babbage, who um, probably is one of the best minds ever to be born on the face of the earth. And we know him as the father of computing. He basically ha was the first person to conceive a programmable general purpose computer. He made this computer as a replacement, I guess, or as an advancement from his differential machine that could only calculate certain equations to something that could perform any calculation that was set before it. And it was way, way, way before its time. You want to know how much before its time it was? Well, when we look at the main components of the analytical engine that Charles Babbage envisioned, it had something called the mill. And the mill was basically the processor of today, the CPU and the AL ALU. It even was the first type of thing that had conditional branching, something like an if-then-else type of uh, an operation. It had something called the store. The store was the memory of the computer. It had 1,050-digit numbers inside this uh, conceived computer. 
it had something called the reader, which was the input. It uh, took these jacquard punch cards, which were used to um, automate looms already, and said that this would be how we would um, present input to this, this engine. And it had the printer. Charles Babbage, was uh, he came from a, a, a background of uh, printing books and trying to get the books to be correct. And so it was very important for him that the output of the calculations of this computer would be um, something that would be printed. So he was able to print out things such as mathematical tables with the envisioned, envisioned analytical engine. And so really, if we look at these components that were in this um, co concept, it was 100 years pretty much before um, any other real computers came out. But it had all the basics that we still use today, as we saw in the previous uh, uh, few slides. Um, another interesting thing about this uh, Envision computer by, by Charles Babbage, it was unfortunately never completed. He uh, passed away in 1871 without finishing it, passed a, the design on to his son who tried to come and bring it a bit more forward, but it was never funded and uh, was never built. It was a much too complex and expensive project. Um, but, uh, however, there are parts of it, as you can see here, that have been built, and there are projects to try and build the whole thing. But an, an interesting part about the, um, the analytical engine is that um, one of his kind of uh, groupies, you could call her, Ada Lovelace, she was the daughter of Lord Byron, she um, designed an algorithm basically to calculate Bernoulli numbers using this analytical engine. And um, I don't know if they called it an algorithm then, but it was a little note that she wrote how that you could use this engine to um, calculate the Bernoulli numbers. And that is now considered the first ever computer program. And so Ada Lovelace is our first uh, computer programmer. And she's been recognized uh, many times for that, first with the um, computer language called Ada. And um, nowadays, you know, uh, NVIDIA has um, named their latest um, architecture and processors after Miss Lovelace. So that was a mechanical computer. It was based on, it was powered by a steam engine, but everything was purely mechanical, and it was way, way, way before its time. The real breakthrough with computers came when um, Alan Turing came along. And Alan Turing, if uh, Babbage was one of the greatest minds of all time, maybe Turing was the greatest mind of all time. And in 1936, he came up with this paper where he wrote something about a machine that has finite states, an infinite tape or an infinite memory that can hold symbols on it, and has a scanner that can read and write to the current position. So this is kind of a, um, even though this was a completely abstract idea, this is kind of something that someone built that would be a Turing machine. It's this tape over here, and it's this scanner over here, and on the tape you can have symbols, and this tape is infinite. Okay. Well, at any moment, the current symbol is scanned, as we can see here in this kind of illustration over here. And depending on the state, um, the state of the whole computer or the state or what it sees, where it is, the position of the scanner and what the symbol is, it may replace the symbol, and the scanner can be moved to a new position, specifically just right and left, but it really can be moved to a different position. And Turing showed that this type of machine can compute all computable problems. I don't know if he knew it at the time what he was talking about, but this is a groundbreaking concept. And this is really the idea behind all computers nowadays. What computers nowadays need, they need a state, they need uh, the able, the, some memory, and they need to be able to decide based on the state of the computer um, to change the, uh, the, what the memory has in it and to move to a different position in the computer. And that is a Turing machine. And Turing complete list, completeness is this idea that any system that can simulate such a Turing machine really can compute all computable problems. And that is what our computers are today with the um, small part that they don't have an infinite memory. But really big amounts of memory such as we have today can be considered infinite and so they are Turing machines. And guess what? That first Turing machine ever built or ever conceived was the analytical engine by Charles Babbage though uh, many, many years before, ba before, before Turing was born and came up with his idea. So early computers that were brought forward by this uh, concept that Turing, uh, that Turing devised, and, and Turing himself was involved in the design of many computers, though a lot of them were done at Bletchley Park and held secret uh, really until the 70s or so. But the ENIAC is really often considered the first computer. It wasn't held secret. And there's a lot of arguments about what is the what would be considered a computer, what is the first computer, and so forth. But ENIAC is kind of one of these things that in pop culture is considered the first computer. It's actually the first electronically programmable general purpose computer. It was the first electronic Turing machine. So basically, this thing could calculate anything as long as you programmed it to do it. However, 
programming it was really, really, really um, complex. You see these ladies here that are moving all kinds of wires? Well, they're programming this computer. To program it, you had to connect all these wires that were um, throughout the building that held the ENIAC, you know, from place to place. And this could take anywhere from days to week just to program it to do some different calculation than it was doing previously. So this is not scalable, obviously. And that means that really a new concept is necessary to make computing scalable and uh, be, be really much more useful than this crazy machine that took weeks and weeks to uh, reprogram. So these two guys who were involved in the design of ENIAC, Mockley and Eckert, they were in a think tank that was working on a project called the EDVAC. And they came up with this crazy idea, which nowadays we can't even think of anything different. But they came up with the idea as to reprogram a computer, what you actually need is to treat the instructions that tell the computer what to do that make up the program. We just need to treat them as another piece of data. And a guy who was actually part of the think tank, one of the greatest minds as well of those times, a great mathematician named um, von Neumann, he came and he met with um, Mockley and Eckert, and he heard their idea, and he immediately saw the greatness of this idea, and he uh, wrote up a quick draft. It's called the first draft of the report on the EDVAC, and he sent it around um, without patenting it and without uh, giving any credit, actually, in that, in that part to Mockley and Eckert. And and the draft went around and um, became actually the idea, what, which is called the stored program computer. And nowadays, we actually call it a von Neumann architecture, even though the people who came up with it were Mally and, Mackley and Eckert. So what are stored program computers? Stored program computers, or von Neumann machines, they are um, instructions that are represented in binary, just like the data is represented in binary. The programs are stored in memory, just like the data is stored in the memory. And the memory can be read and written when given an address. So we have the CPU over here, and we have the memory over here. And the memory just has some sort of binary word over here. We have something that is called the program counter. The program counter points, basically, at the address where our current instruction is held. And um, that is how we know what we're supposed to do. Um, furthermore, we, uh, we have this program flow. In other words, we can go around to different places by just incrementing the program counter, bringing it to the next step, and reading the next instruction that's serially, uh, sequentially inside the program, or by branching and moving the program counter just by changing the address that's stored inside this register to a different place. And that, ha that is what is called a von Neumann machine. So this is interesting because in this way, programs can operate on programs. Look at a compiler or a linker or something like that. It's just a program that's working on a program. And when we ship a program, we ship them as a bunch of uh, binary numbers, zeros and ones, just like data. And therefore, we call these binaries. In fact, there's something called binary compatibility that allows compiled programs to work on different computers as long as really they can do the same thing. This brought up an idea called micro-coded computers. So in early processors, we had a very different technological landscape than we do today. In those days, read-only memory was very cheap, and it was much faster than random access memory. In addition, logic, all these logic gates and flip-flops and so forth were very expensive um, uh, when you compare them to ROM. So it was easier to take read-only memory and use it. And finally, really designing the control unit and getting it right was very hard and very expensive to change. And therefore, Maurice Wilkes of IBM in 1958 came up with this idea of microcoding. Instead of designing all of the control and making it right and so forth and very hard to change, they would make the uh, control in, in ROM. And this was called microcode. What you could then do is kind of separate between the architecture, that the instructions that were written by the architects. They would be very um, kind of abstract, uh, long things that would say, go do this and that. The microcode, which would be rather easily fixed, you just need to make a new ROM mask over here, um, would take those instructions, turn them into smaller programs, and send them into the data path, which was the kind of heart of the computer that was already made and uh, you didn't want to change. So um, the microcode turns the complex instructions into a set of data path control signals that, that control the flow. And it's part of the micro architecture and not visible to the programmer. So the programmer doesn't know what the microcode is actually doing. It just, know the, it just knows that you kind of write an instruction, and then it makes the data path do what it's supposed to do. So it was uh, first used to the design uh, the control unit of the EDSAC2. And it was really easier to design. It was easier to fix bugs, um, to support new instructions without changing the data path. But it has some uh, basic uh, 
uh, basic problems or disadvantages that it does not benefit from microarchitectural innovations. For instance, you cannot pipeline this thing to get instruction level parallelism. Um, better compilers make this in a lot of ways redundant, and it's uh, pr pretty hard to reprogram it. So microcoded computers kind of started to fall out of style as the basic uh, things that we said before changed, and with Moore's law, um, things got cheaper and cheaper. And um, we moved from the CISC or complex um, ar architectures to RISC or the reduced instruction set architectures. So what exactly are CISC and RISC? So complex uh, complex instruction set architectures or computers, what are known as CISC computers. Um, they have a large variety of instructions, such as those with the microcoded computers. Um, they can, can perform very complex tasks. So you could have one instruction that would do something like string searching. But, and they were very common for early computer architectures. They may be broken down with microcode or some other way to simpler type of instructions. But in the end, what the um, programmer saw and what the compiler had to spit out were very complex instructions. But this came under kind of a, um, a challenge in the early 80s or late 70s when in, at IBM, John Koch, he saw that uh, most of the, these complex uh, instructions were not being used. Um, so instead, why don't we go and make some sort of a different type of a reduced instruction set computer that has more simple instructions that we can make them really um, high quality and fast and so forth. If we do a lot, lot of fast, real fast instructions, we can carry out complex tasks. And therefore, we don't need to make our architecture so complicated, which will reduce the ability uh, to get to um, very high uh, kind of uh, high optimization. And it will enable us to do different types of things like pipelining and so forth. So in a risk architecture, we have fewer and simpler instructions. Most of the compiled code in six, in six uh, computers only used a few of the available instructions. So why not just provide those instructions? And um, usually these are what we call load store instruction sets, as we'll discuss in a little bit. So operations are not usually performed directly on memory locations. They're only performed on, led, uh, on registers, and it's easy to pipeline. And what I show over here is the chip called RISC-1 from Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley gave this name RISC to uh, this type of idea. And uh, it was a 5 micron NMOS chip with, that ran at 1 megahertz and had 44,000 transistors. So that's basically the first uh, academic, at least, RISC machine. Um, and the three people who are really attributed to the invention or the, the bringing forward of risk are these three people. John Koch, who uh, came up with this idea with the IBM 801 in 1980. Um, and then it was developed in, ac in academia by Dave Patterson, who um, was in charge of this risk machine over here in the early 80s in 1982. And John Hennessy, who came up with MIPS at Stanford a bit later. And um, recently, Patterson and Hennessy actually won the Turing Award for their work. Um, and so virtually all the ISAs invented since the 80s are RISC. Nowadays, everything basically is a, a RISC architecture that's invented. With that, there is a separation between two categories of how von Neumann architectures are made. So a regular von Neumann architecture or Princeton architecture is what we said before. So instructions and data are in a single memory space. Everything has the same memory space, and therefore we have a bus of address and a bus of data that accesses the memory. The problem with that, that is that the CPU usually has to go every um, you know, operation and go to wherever the uh, program counter is looking at and take the, the instruction that's in there. And therefore, it's occupying the bus that's accessing the memory, and it can't use the memory to do other things. So it kind of limits the operating bandwidth. And therefore, um, they came up with something that is now known as the Harvard architecture, where we actually separate the address and data versus the address and instructions. So we have two separate buses. One goes to a data memory, and one goes to a program memory. And this may have been difficult in the early days of computing because uh, of the cost of things. But nowadays, that's pretty trivial. And most architectures will have such a Harvard architecture where we are not limited by this access to um, the program memory and the data memory at once. Um, I will say that in a, in a bigger level, when we go to lower levels of memory, then um, we're talking about von Neumann architectures. Everything is in the same memory space. But usually, we have some sort of tightly coupled or, or low-level cache of data and of uh, program memory that's going to be separated so we are not limited by the bandwidth of accessing them. Um, almost all risk designs feature a Harvard architecture. This led us to what is known as the computer architecture monopoly. So 
really there are thousands of instruction set architectures that have been invented and used over the years. Um, we mentioned a few of them, and really uh, any one of you could go and sit for a while and invent your own uh, you know, instruction set architecture. But the vast majority of them, they just die off and they disappear. There are really only two, I mean three general purpose ISAs that are commonly found today. The first of those is the Intel x86. It's actually known um, as Intel x86-64, but it should be called the AMD 64 because they were the first ones to um, extend the Intel x86 architecture to a 64-bit um, uh, word. Okay, And this is a CISC architecture. Um, so out of the two or three general purpose ISAs that uh, are around today, one of them is a CISC architecture. And it really dominates uh, the laptop, desktop, and server domains. There's been a lot about this on the news lately if this, uh, if this is uh, kind of breaking down. But still, really, the Intel architecture, which is made primarily by Intel and AMD, really dominates this space. The, on the opposite level, the other of the two that I uh, crossed out here is ARM. And ARM, which is, stands for Acorn Risk Machines, means that it was originally a risk architecture. But um, currently, it's kind of hard to say that it's risk because it really the um, uh, advanced versions of the ARM architecture have many, many, many uh, operations that can do pretty complex things. But at its basis, it was started as a risk architecture. And ARM really took, took over the embedded computing domain. So they kind of had a monopoly, at least until recently, on this whole space. So this was a real monopoly between these two companies who had their proprietary architectures. And really, in our uh, computers today, most of the things we will find will either have an Intel or an ARM-based uh, computer inside. There is a new player on the block, and that's why we have this three and not two, and it's called RISC-V. It was actually an academic program um, under the, the big uh, you know, hat of uh, Dave Patterson over there, but really developed by Kirsty Stanovich and uh, some of his uh, students, who they developed something as what started as a real um, kind of uh, an academic uh, um, exercise and turned into something that really passed that kind of hump of being uh, able to be a real architecture that hopefully will survive and thrive. And it's RISC-V, and it's an open source architecture. So it's not owned by one certain um, company, but it actually is run by an organization that includes many, many, many companies and ac academics, and it's open source, and we will um, use it actually during this, uh, the, the, this course at, for our examples. I just want to mention that there are other ISAs that survive. I mean, MIPS that we mentioned from, uh, from Hennessy back there still survives in, in millions, maybe billions of, of machines today. And you know, you have things like the PowerPC architecture and different IBM architectures that still survive today. But they mainly are used as legacy, or um, there are lots of uh, different type of proprietary ISAs that are used in application-specific purposes inside different machines. But if you're talking about general purpose things and things that are well known and, and sold to different um, you know, by different vendors, we're talking about only these three, basically. So the question is, can't we be eyes agnostic? Can we not pay attention to the instruction set architecture itself? And that's a, that's a good question. Well, I just want to mention compilation, which is uh, an important thing that we're going to be discussing today, is the translation of high-level code, like C code, C++, Java, whatever, to machine code. Um, that means turning it into the actual instruction set architecture that we can use. It converts a program from the source language uh, to an equivalent program in another language. For example, if we uh, compile from uh, C code to RISC-V, we're going to get RISC-V assembly at the output. But when you uh, look at that, a lot of you probably have used Python before, and we don't compile Python. We just run Python inside some sort of Python shell. And that's because it's an interpreted language. And what an interpreter does, it directly executes a program in the source language. We write, you know, print hello, and it prints, right? We don't first compile it and then run the uh, compiled version of the print hello. And that's because an interpreter is a program that is able to execute other programs. In general, what we do is we interpret high-level languages when efficiency is not critical, because it's really easy to use. It's, uh, it's uh, much easier to debug and to change and modify and so forth. We don't have to go through all the compilation and so forth. But it's actually very inefficient. And so therefore, we translate to a lower-level language when we want to increase performance. And we get this language execution continuum that goes all the way from you know the uh, interpreted languages like Python, which is really easy to program but inefficient to interpret, all the way down to machine code, which is really, really, really difficult to program, but it's very efficient to interpret. So when we want something that's very you know, efficient, we'll um, compile it to machine code. When we want something that is really easy to play with, we'll, we'll do it in something like Python. Um, I put Java over here on the left because it's kind of uh, 
has a, this feature where we have this Java virtual machine where you kind of compile things into uh, into this uh, kind of um, agnostic language that can run on different different uh, on different platforms, and that's kind of uh, runs on uh, the different platforms. But really, you can actually compile Java all the way down into bytecode and uh, and run it in the end. So the only question is, do we ever want to um, interpret machine language? Do we want an interpreter for you know that machine code? And the, I mean, because it's pretty clear why we want to interpret something like Python, which is a high-level language. Would we ever want to interpret machine language? And the answer is yes, indeed we would. Well, just the first uh, example of this is uh, for emulating or simulating what our machine code is going to do. So, for example, Risk Five has a, a, a simulator for learning and debugging, which is called Whisper, which uh, will enable us to write things in Assembler and run them and see what they're doing. So that's an emulator or an interpreter for um, for a machine machine uh, language type of a, of a, of a program. However, there's um, real reasons to use it. And one of them is backwards compatibility. And Apple is a great um, example of this. So the Apple Macintosh started with the Motorola 680. And at some point, they decided to move over to a different ISA to PowerPC. So to enable to um, have backwards compatibility and be able to run the programs that were compiled for the Motorola 680, they had to provide some sort of intermediate level of an interpreter that could take the, um, the assembly language that was in Motorola 680 and run it on their new architecture. They then went ahead and uh, several years ago decided to move from PowerPC into x86. And if you've been listening to news in the last few years, you would know that Apple decided to leave x86 and move to what they call Apple Silicon, um, uh, which is an ARM-based architecture. So starting with their M1, they uh, moved to their ARM-based architecture. And if I bought Photoshop or something like that for um, an x86 version of my Mac, and now I wanted to run it on my new M1, what I would have to do is uh, you know, run this on some sort of interpreter that stands in the way until um, Adobe or whoever made uh, you know, the program would put out a new version that is really compiled for the, the new architecture, in this case, the ARM architecture. 